Hello, NO people. Hello, everybody. Before we start, I want to say a few words about our guest, about uh, Quadrant, and about Langchain. Um, Kasper Lukaski is a developer advocate at Quadrant. Quadrant is a open source neural search engine, and it is also one of the fastest growing startups by GitHub stars in the last quarter of 2022. Kasper has extensive experience in data engineering, data science, machine learning, and software design. Recently, he's been exploring the world of um, similarity learning and vector search. And that's why today he talked about uh, with us about question answering without boilerplate with the help of the interfaces offered by Quadrant and Langchain. And if you want, you can go in and leave some stars on GitHub. Um, Chech, thank you for taking the time and the stage is yours. Test. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, that's going to be a pleasure to present uh, both Langchain and Quadrant because both tools are really uh, exciting uh, and uh, got a lot of uh, a lot of interest in the uh, recent months, uh, especially Langchain uh, along with GPT Index. Those two libraries seem to be uh, like uh, taking a lot of interest uh, for those who would like to. Uh, incorporate some large language models directly into the applications. So that's why we also decided we need to offer a way to integrate them uh, with Quadrant because uh, many of our users uh, were struggling with that and just wanted to have a, a simple interface so they could combine both tools. And uh, this presentation is going to be like an extended version of the article that you can already find on our website. Uh, if anybody is interested, that hopefully we can also share the notebook uh, just after the uh, after the uh, presentation today. So if anybody wants to just go step by step and make some changes to uh, adapt that to your own needs, uh, that will be all possible. And. So basically, Langchain is a tool that uh, simplified creating the applications using clar la large language models a lot. And if you are already a user of Langchain, then you know that you can develop a fully flexed uh, application that exposes some uh, great, uh, great features of large language models within just a few lines of code because those typical uh, chains so this is the nomenclature that is being used quite often. Uh, they already allow you to do quite impressive things uh, without worrying about uh, integrating with different uh, providers of, uh, of embeddings or with different uh, document stores. And uh, Langchain is actually an abstraction layer that uh, provides an, uh, inter unified interfaces so you don't really need to worry about the, the way that you are going to integrate with different tools. And that also pays off uh, during the experimentation phase, uh, while uh, which you are actually able to switch between different, uh, different tools just to test things out. And uh, Quadrant is also one of the libraries that got integrated recently. Uh, we are also working uh, on some extension to it just because we see there are plenty of use cases for which that could be used. So hopefully uh, we can all see uh, see some improvements and some extensions pretty soon. And there are some issues with large language models. And this screenshot actually comes from a, a GitHub repository, which is how I lost the link, but basically this is a repository at that least uh, some of the uh, issues with chat GPT answers. So here we, we, we are just asking the, the model, uh, how many months does it take nine women to, ma to make one baby? Uh, and we ask to provide us with a simple explanation of that and why the model decided that way. And surprisingly enough, the answer of, of the model is that nine women uh, will need just a month to to make us uh, to make one baby. Uh, obviously, this is not true, but 
probably the uh, um, our expectations to the model while we were asking this question were uh, th that question were uh, were simply too high because ChatGPT in a nutshell is a neural network that has some internal knowledge incorporated directly into its parameters but nothing really more and it cannot really extrapolate over uh, those uh, those specific topics that it was trained on. So we cannot really expect it to be uh, hundred, uh, right 100% of times. Of course, sometimes in, it can provide some uh, some true statements, but in general, we should be worried about uh, the factuality of this kind of models. It doesn't necessarily be chat GPT, but if you choose any other large language model, uh, then you need to make sure that that those statements that it generates are simply true. So in a, in a nutshell, chat GPT-like models will always struggle with generating factual statements if we do not provide any kind of context, because uh, those models have some general understanding of some basic processes, but uh, cannot really guarantee to produce the uh, the pr proper answer to any given question. Of course, the it's still a massive improvement over the old methods that we had, because they are actually able to provide us with uh, grammarly correct statements, and that's a huge improvement. But still, there is an issue. If we just wanted to use them directly to provide the answers to our own uh, knowledge base, uh, then definitely that won't be possible. But there are, of course, some ways of how to overcome that issue. Um, in a nutshell, we are going to implement a system that is going to answer some natural questions. And I took some of the examples from the uh, from the data set, uh, which is linked here. This is uh, available at uh, Google uh, AI.google.com website. And I also pre-processed the data, so it is just way easier to follow. But basically, it uh, it provides a full HTML content of the website uh, that was used to scrape those uh, questions and answers from. And by answers, I don't necessarily mean a specific piece that we would expect uh, for a specific query, but instead some longer pieces of text, like whole documents, uh, in which the answer should be uh, should be uh, provided, but not necessarily. It's not not always uh, the case. Uh, so just without uh, just not to worry about some further pre-processing. I just did that on my own, and and today we are going to work on a just a specific subset of that data. A few uh, few examples uh, that I extracted from it. Uh, just not to worry about the cost of that solution because uh, we are going to use some uh, paid models uh, for for the proposals of that example. And all those uh, examples are just stored on our uh, on our uh, cloud. If you are, if you want, you can also uh, download it uh, download them. Uh, there are two files, uh, two JSON uh, line files with uh, both questions and answers. And uh, they will be downloaded uh, into the current directory easily. Okay, now we can, of course, load those files and display it, display the first question and the first answer. And as you may see, the question is fairly, fairly simple, but the answer is uh, a whole document that possibly uh, may contain the, the, uh, the exact, uh, the exact uh, response that we would expect from, from the system. And coming back to those large language models, um, as already said, they have some general understanding of, of the word and uh, can sometimes provide a valid answer, uh, but it is way better to provide some uh, facts that they could rely on in order to provide us with, with the answers, especially if you have a knowledge base which is specific for your organization and you would like the model to extract uh, the facts uh, based on that, that, that database. 
so in in this case you cannot simply incorporate those uh those facts into the model you technically we could fine tune them of course that shouldn't be an issue if we had an access to uh to the uh, original model the fine tuning should be should be possible but still if our knowledge is updated on daily manner uh that won't be that easy and in order to fix those issues uh, with uh, LLMs, uh, we need to act differently. And one of the possible ways to overcome them is to use a separate system that will be storing uh, our knowledge base uh, so we can extract some context and provide it into the, uh, into the language model. So instead of producing some results, it will be just extracting a meaningful piece of text that should be a possible answer because that's what uh, that's actually what those uh, large language models are great in. They are uh, really great at producing uh, at producing texts. So and and also in text understanding, so they can extract some information from given uh, given context, and that's that's the way to go. And of course, we are going to use Quadrant that is going to act as a, a semantic search knowledge base. So uh, as a first step, we are going to, to put all the, all the facts, all the documents uh, that we have obtained into Quadrant. So then we can query, uh, query it for the most similar, most promising answer, some, some sort of uh, answer candidates. Uh, from which our large language model is going to extract the, the proper answer. And why do we need a vector database? So um, this is going to be a brief introduction to embeddings for those who are not really into them. And sorry for those pictures. Uh, uh, I know the quality could be a bit better, but uh, I'm just uh, I'm just learning to uh, to perform some hand drawing. So. Hopefully they will get better uh, pretty soon. But basically, uh, vector database acts as a quick, approximate nearest neighbors uh, solution. So basically, you are probably all familiar with KNN, which stands for K nearest neighbors. That's probably one of the simplest algorithms available. And uh, ANN, uh, approximate nearest neighbors is like is just an approximate algorithm that performs basically the same process. It tries to extract the closer points in a specific latent space, so they can be used uh, as some sort of uh, similar objects uh, based on those uh, based on those uh, vector representations and. Uh, deep neural networks are actually quite uh, quite good in creating some vector embeddings for any type of data. So we can take images, text, videos, or whatever data you like, and uh, put it through a properly trained deep neural network, and then uh, uh, just just receive a single vector uh, of uh, a single uh, single fixed dimensional vector. That we can easily compare to some different uh, different vectors, and the idea is some sim similar objects, some similar images, pieces of text, or similar videos, whatever you choose, will be also similar to each other in this vector space, and that's basically it. And Quadrant as a vector database allows you to do that uh, efficiently because, as we all know, KNN doesn't scale that well. If you have a few thousand of points. Uh, then you may simply start struggling with KNN approach. If you go to millions, then uh, that won't be even possible to use it in any kind of production load. So definitely we need this approximation in order to do that efficiently and Quadrant allows you to, to do it quite easily. And uh, Quadrant uses HNSW, which stands for Hierarchical Navigable Small Words. This is the best ANL algorithm so far, according to benchmarks. Uh, but we also have a, a have a custom extension of the algorithm that allows us to uh, perform the some additional filtering directly into in a vector search uh, phase. Uh, so why do we have it? Basically, in the real world, there will be some cases when the similarity won't be enough. Let's say I'm in Tokyo and I would like to eat uh, some great sushi. Uh, I'm vegan. 
And uh, that's why I would also love to find some, find a great uh, sushi restaurant. But I also have some additional constraints, like like the city I'm currently in, uh, the fact that I that it should be vegan and possibly some kind of threshold on the price. So if we were just looking at at the picture then finding some similar uh similar objects would be probably quite easy but if we also need to apply those uh, those filters uh then things are not uh, not going to be that easy uh things are going to be a bit com more complicated uh, just because it's it cannot be directly exposed in a in a vector uh, vector uh representation that's why we have this uh, additional mechanism and this is quite unique for quadrant just because it's directly incorporated into vector search phase what makes this really makes that really fast um uh, but that's it when it comes to to quadrant um, we're coming back to fixing those uh large language models so first of all we cannot really bring some new facts into the large language model and just um uh, let him know that Th those are, are just uh, are just simply right. Uh, that would require some further fine tuning, uh, which is first of all impossible for some closed source models, but also quite expensive uh, if we uh, wanted to do that in on a daily manner. So that will be uh, unfeasible for uh, for majority of companies or majority of organizations that would like to benefit from it. And the knowledge will change rapidly in, in real world. So, so that's not the best way to, to solve that. But we can integrate an additional tool like Quadrant, a vector database that will act as some sort of uh, pre-filtering uh, in order to extract some, uh, some uh, similar documents based on the, uh, based on the question and then provide them all to the, to the model so it can just extract this uh, those meaningful pieces, and that's it. We just uh, we are just going to use another step and build a prompt accord uh, prompt to the large language model accordingly. And um, this is actually already implemented into Langchain, so that's why I I, I really uh, fell in love with the library because that allows to allows doing that very easily there is already a, a, a specific chain uh, that allows to perform that directly and uh, also uh, in it also uh, creates a proper prompt that we send to the large language model later on so um, instead of doing that manually we can simply uh, create a, an instance of a, of a proper class in that case vector dbqa and that should that should already work seamlessly. So let's just dive into that and build uh, build that model. Uh, one thing to note: we uh, we are going to be using two separate models, and this is an important fact. Uh, first of all, we need an embedding layer. So uh, this model is going to be used to create the embeddings out of our documents, and those embeddings are going to be stored in in Quadrant. And then we also need this large language model that will be used to generate the answer. Uh, and in, uh, for the first case, for the embeddings, we are going to use one of the sentence transformers, which are quite popular. And, uh, and the pros of, of that is that we can actually host this embedding model uh, locally or on premise. So that uh, do not require some additional costs uh, that uh, that we would need to pay if we decided to use uh, some third party providers. But that's also great for doing some experiments because we can take the simplest model possible and that won't be only cheaper, but also faster uh, compared to those big models because uh, the simpler the model, the, the, the faster it should be. Uh, so those embeddings will be created into uh, will be created out of our set of possible answers, set of documents, and Quadrant will use the same embedding model in order to extract the most similar documents uh, once the query arrives. Um, this is also going to be uh, done seamlessly by the library itself. 
let's just start with creating a proper uh, an instance of a proper class in our case this is going to be hugging face embeddings class for which we need to provide the name of the model to be used and that's basically it uh that doesn't require providing anything else and now we can start the, uh, defining the pipeline so first of all we need quadrants in order to act as as this knowledge base and we also need this this embeddings to uh process our our documents uh so first of all we are going to uh, to run a local quadrant instance if you prefer you can also use our cloud version uh because it's already public and we have a quite a generous uh, free tire but for the for the simplicity you can also uh, also use a local instance then we need to import quadrant class from from a proper python package and create quadrant instance uh and provide some some parameters to it uh basically it can be provided with this class method from text uh and that method takes the set of uh of the documents or possible answers uh we have already loaded them before so there is nothing else to to be done and this is simply a list of texts uh nothing more but that might be uh an, a different different collection not necessarily a list uh, then we need to provide the instance of some sort of embeddings and in our case the, we used uh, hugging face embeddings but if you decide to use anything else uh there are uh, various providers you can just free to choose a different uh different class provided there uh and nothing is going to change from your point of view that will be handled automatically we also need to provide the uh, some uh, quadrant specific uh, configuration we could actually omit i believe this host is is by default local host but just just in order to make sure that we point to a proper proper database uh we should probably keep it as it is but basically th that will automatically handle a whole process we are not even going to use the quadrant client library itself uh directly but instead this is going to be to be done in the background so Langchain is going to uh, process all the documents through the embeddings, so it will create those vector representations and put them into a new quadrant collection. The name of the collection will be chosen randomly, but you can also extract this name later on uh, based on the instance of quadrant that you will you will get. Uh, if you if you prefer to use an existing instance, then of course uh, uh, an existing collection, then you, of course you can do that. Uh, but probably you won't be calling from text, but just create an instance of Quadrant directly. And that's basically it. Once it's launched, we already have a, a Quadrant collection with all the vector representations uh, already in place. So right now we can, of course, use it for uh, for similarity for similarity search. Uh, if I just called the similarity search method. On the created quadrant instance uh, with the first que question from our uh, data set i should receive a list of documents that are the most similar to given query so this is actually going to be to be done uh, by langchain uh, once we uh, integrate this llm but still uh, this is uh, a this is a, a working application that that exposes similarity search with just I don't know five or six lines of code, and so this is fairly easy to start with. If you are fine with those kind of answers, like whole documents, uh, then you already have a have a tool to to solve that. But we are we have a plan to do something better. Because uh, as said, we already can perform the semantic search over those answers, but we do not receive those short and meaningful uh, extracts from uh, from our documents, but instead the whole content of them. So we also need to solve the second piece of simplifying the answers so uh, we can actually interact with our, our database. Um, so there is another step. So first of all, Quadrant will perform the similarity search and extract some uh, some candidates, some re le relevant documents, and then combine them to form a context. So it will take their contents, 
and put them together to be to be then uh, uh, sent into the prompt that we present to the large language model. And in our case, we are going to be using a specific chain uh, chain type, uh, which is called stuffing. Uh, I will explain the details later on. But basically, uh, this prompt is hard coded. It's almost hard coded into LangChain. So basically. Uh, we uh, we have a specific question that is encoded here. In our case, how much is two plus two? Uh, we have a set of documents that possibly answer that question, and those documents are retrieved from Quadrant based on their uh, based on those uh, based on those embeddings, and they are just put into the into the prompt. And we have this instruction that we give to the large language model, like use the following pieces of context to answer the question at the end. If you don't know the answer, just say that you don't know. Don't try to make up an answer. So that actually forces the the model not to uh, not to lie. So it can always provide a valid answer based on those facts that we listed here. Uh, so this is the simplest approach you can imagine. We take all the documents, combine them into a single text, and just send for uh, for the uh, LLM of of our choice. And, Can I uh, just interrupt real quick with a question from chat? Definitely. Um, so Mateo Sasso uh, asks, hello, uh, where are we passing the set of documents? Uh, let me just combine them really quickly. Basically, um, I don't know if you remember, but at the, uh, at the very beginning, we just loaded some uh, exactly two JSON files. One was the list of, of questions and one was the list of documents. Documents were stored in answers uh, variable. So this is basically a list of text, list of uh, document content, contents that we pass through uh, from text method of quadrants. So the whole processing from text to embedding is done internally. So there is nothing to, uh, to be done manually uh, in order to create those embeddings. This is exactly the line when we passed all the documents, so they are already stored in, in, in the in the database. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my confusion was that uh, now I understood that the function of uh, Kdrent is to approximate the questions to the documents. So that's why I did a confusion with the answers, but I think that answers will come next when the set of documents are already selected, right? Yeah, exactly. Maybe that that might be yeah. confusing that this is called answers. Yeah, I agree. But yeah, you are absolutely right. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let yeah, me come make back. a follow-up question about the embeddings while we're on the on the slide. Sorry. Um you uh mentioned it uh, you're using the sentence transformers, right? Yeah, exactly. So basically expert. So the um dimensionality of the embeddings is either 600, uh, 768 or 1024 for the large models, right? So these are the two options, basically. Uh, yeah, I believe. I believe, okay. but we are going to be using uh, sentence transformers only for for this first uh, embedding, layers, uh, embedding layer. So those embeddings that go to, to Quadrant. But then okay. we are going to be using a different provider. So the, that won't be a, uh, any kind of uh, SVIRT uh anymore thank you actually in the second phase we are not going to be using any kind of embeddings to be honest because that was uh, that's probably the place we we stopped before basically we will uh, use those uh those uh documents extracted from quadrant to create this prompt we'll be just pasting those contents into the into the prompt and this prompt this text is going to be sent to the large language model. So it's not going to be to be uh, encoded into any kind of vector, but instead we will send a raw text uh, through a specific API. So that's, that's probably also an answer to that. Um, we need two different models. And the first one is going to perform some feature extraction. It's going to extract some features out of our texts uh, by converting them into vectors. 
And the second model is actually helpful for text generation or summarization, however we want to we want to call that. And uh, the chain that we are going to use is called stuff or stuffing in the library. And this is the simplest way uh, of how to solve uh, question answering with, with uh, vector database in the loop. But there are also some other, other ways that we are going to explain a bit uh, later on. And this is a um, whole strategy diagram uh, of how we are going to tackle that. So let's say our user asks this specific question. So first of all, we are going to send this question to LangChain so it can send the same question to the embedding model of our choice. And this embedding model produces the vector representation of that query. This question vector is now sent to quadrant, so it, it can extract the top K similar documents, documents similar to the provided query. This is actually by encoder architecture. Once we have those top K facts extracted from quadrant, we are going to create a prompt. So that's exactly the same one as presented uh, like a slide before. Uh, it forms this hard-coded uh, hard instruction, then the whole context uh, created out of those top K facts, then the question, and then it actually uh, asks to provide the, provide the answer based on those, uh, those contextual information we, uh, we uh, put here. Then uh, this is sent to LLM, uh, so large language model, depending on what we choose, there are various options available, and this LLM is uh, is responsible for creating the answer. Here we would expect that the answer is just four, and that's basically the whole chain we are doing here. Uh, there are three systems involved: uh, the embedding model, quadrant, and and large language model at the very end. And LangChain acts as some kind of uh, manager over those three systems. Um, and that's basically it. So that's high time for the for the second phase. Uh, it all sounds like it was like if it was pretty complex, uh, as there are three systems involved. But thanks to uh, thanks to Langchain, it might be implemented uh, very easily. Um, since there are various LLMs, we need to choose one. Uh, I've chosen OpenAI. Uh, because that's probably uh, the most commonly used one. And I can import the proper LLM uh, implementation from a, from a specific package. If you decide to use Cohere or any different provider, it's also possible that the interface will be exactly the same. And that's something that LangChain is really great about because you don't need to worry about using specific interfaces to any different provider. If you still experiment, you can freely choose a different model and just check out uh, which one works best in your specific case. Uh, we also need this vector dbqa chain uh, that uh, sort of uh, performs uh, all those steps uh, involved. And if we create the OpenAI uh, instance, uh, it automatically loads the OpenAI API key from environmental variables. Uh, to be honest, I uh, today morning I wanted to like go through the uh, through this whole notebook once again, and I'm not sure if you faced that, but there are, there were huge problems with the availability of OpenAI. That's why I prefer showing this uh, already launched notebooks instead of running them uh, just during the presentation, just because I was getting so many errors today. Uh, OpenAI is still pretty unstable. I have to admit. But then the only thing that is missing is to create the vector dbqa uh, instance. And there are also uh, some help of, uh, helper static methods of, of this specific class uh, from Chainime is one of them. We need to provide the large language model of our choice, the, choose the chain type. We are going to be using stuff. Again, I will describe the, uh, the details later on. And uh, choose the vector store in which we expect those uh, those candidate documents to be to be present along with their vector representations 
Here I just, just decided not to return the source documents just to reduce the overhead. We are not going to use them at all, so they are not, not, really, uh, not really necessary. But if you prefer to also see which documents uh, have been chosen by Quadrant or a different vector database of your choice, you can set that to true and they will be also provided. And that actually creates the whole processing chain. That doesn't really take long to, to create just because there is no process to be done. It's just a simple configuration of the whole, the whole chain. But uh, our document store, Quadrant, uh, already has those, those embeddings in place. And that only creates like a, uh, like a configuration of how to call things in, in what sequence. So right now we have an instance of vector dbqa, and that's enough to perform this question answering on our on our uh, set of documents. Uh, and hopefully that is going to solve this problem with factuality of uh, large language models. So um, instead of calling that on all the questions that we have collected, I, I just selected some of them, uh, five to be more precise, and I will be seeking for the answer in my documents, uh, but only for those five examples, just to uh, like cherry pick uh, some of them and show that 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 works in general, but probably uh, won't be able to handle all the all the possible questions just because the the amount of data we provided as possible answers is uh, still pretty limited. But for those cases, it should work pretty fine. Uh, so. Here is just the output of the of the model. Please just know that this is the whole operation of calling our our uh, question answering chain. We just need to uh, launch a single single method with a text provided as the only parameter, and that should already produce the proper answer. So those five questions have been have been selected. First of all, we ask for a specific artist and what uh, she's famous for. Uh, we also, there are somehow music related only, but, but we also uh, ask them about, about the other artist, another artist uh, and et cetera. Here, this is an interesting piece just because we asked for the uh, lyrics of a specific song. And since they were unavailable in our, in our uh, database or just not described with this specific title, the model decided not to pretend to know the answer, but instead just uh, just uh, responded simply with "I don't know." So that's something that we would expect from uh, from those models, just to make sure that they provide some some facts, which are some some answers which are true in reality. And the last question was hopefully answered properly, but that's basically it. Within like ten lines of code. Uh, not more. We were able to to design the uh, the first solution that tackles the issue of of answering the questions on some natural uh, natural uh, data set. And this already uh, incorporates the semantic search power of of uh, of vector embeddings with the uh, generative uh, power of the large language models. And there are various uh, various chain types available and stuff. The, the chain type that we used so far is the simplest one possible, just because it just takes uh, all the documents provided and creates a single prompt to the large language models. Uh, so actually, if you pay for, for the usage for those uh, large language models, then definitely that's the possibly the, the cheapest way to go, but but it has some pros and cons. And I would also love to, to introduce some other types so you can have a, an overview of what is possible and how uh, how differently though the, the issue of question answering might be tackled uh, with Langchain. Uh, so this is based on the on the official docs uh, and staffing is the is the strategy that we use uh, already. So uh, as mentioned, this is the simplest way, combine all the documents in a single prompt, send it the whole prompt with, with this context data into the uh, LLM, and then uh, uh, it, in theory, should be, uh, should be able to, to uh, provide, us the, uh, provide us the exact answer to the given question. There is one 
big problem related to that because all of those uh, LLMs will typically have uh, some sort of length uh, limit. So we cannot provide a prompt uh, with possibly unlimited amount of text, but instead they are limited to a uh, number of characters or number for a number of tokens being used. And if we exceed this context length, we cannot really work uh, with those documents that well. Let's say if we extract just two candidate documents, uh, there are some chances that we uh, won't extract the matching matching document that contains the answer. But if we decide to load, I don't know, a thousand candidates, then we probably will exceed this, this uh, context length limit quite easily uh, for every single prompt sent to LLM. So that's not the way to work with if you have larger, uh, longer documents in your database. But there is also MapReduce. Uh, which in, ter uh, in turn uh, sent an uh, initial prompt of uh, for every single document extracted from the database. So that actually can be parallelized, uh, assuming that OpenAI API works properly. You can you can do that. You can send several uh, several uh, requests at the same time, collect the responses, and each prompt in that case will uh, will ask to extract the answer for the same question, but from this single document only. And then once those all documents, all answers from all documents are combined together, we ask another, we send another prompt. Uh, so, uh, so in this last prompt, we ask this LLM to extract the, uh, the most possible, uh, the, the, the best answer based on those answer uh, generated from those single documents. So that requires lots more requests to the LLM APIs than, than staffing. Instead of uh, a single call, we, we will have K prompts sent to uh, send for each document and then the final, the final call to just to, let's say, summarize or extract, choose the final answer. Um, so uh, that's also that, that might be also um, an issue. That might be also an issue if the answer is not um, not in a single document, not contained in a single document. Let's say we have some shorter pieces of text like paragraphs, and uh, the answer is uh, partially in one of them and the other. Uh, with this uh, with this approach, we may lose that information and simply do not generate the best possible answer from, from data that we possess. Um, there is also another type, which is called refine. And um, here we, uh, that cannot be paralyzed uh, just because it iteratively asks for, for an answer based on a document and the set of, uh, of the answers that we collected so far. So let's say we have like three documents extracted from the vector database. So first of all, we send the initial prompt to find the answer uh, in, a, in the first document. Then in the second prompt, we are going to include the second document, but also the answer to our first prompt. So it will be just building the, the knowledge iteratively. Um, here are some issues with the, uh, with the order of the documents, because uh, the answer might be different depending on how we order our documents. Uh, but assuming our, our vector database and embeddings model is uh, working fine, we should be able to provide the most uh, promising uh, document as a first uh, as the first one and then just build build the proper answer. Still, that requires uh, more calls than staffing. Here for K documents, can K candidates, we are going to send K uh, prompt into large language model. And those are not independent. So if we have, if we want to uh, prefetch, let's let's say a hundred documents, then we will need to have a hundred consecutive calls to the to the API that may slow down the whole process. And there is the last possible chain type for a question answering with vector database included, which is called map pre rank. So uh, that is uh, um, just a different different approach to map reduce. Here, instead of asking the, uh, for a specific answer, we also ask the large language model 
about some uh, score uh, of how uh, how sure it is that this is the proper answer to our question. And we include this score uh, to choose the, the best answer just because the highest score win, wins. So that's that's the that's the last approach. Um, it has the same pro, uh, or, or similar pros like uh, MapReduce, but requires uh, one call, uh, one call to one prompt uh, less uh, than uh, simple MapReduce, just because we do not need to combine all the answers and uh, create this final prompt. But instead, we can just uh, just uh, rely on those uh, scores. Uh, returned by those large language uh, by the large language model of our choice, uh, and the cons are also quite similar. It cannot combine information between documents. So if we are pretty sure that the answer should be uh, should be present in a single document, we should be uh, fine to to use this this approach. I can also imagine. There's uh, designing as uh, a different approach, like dividing the original uh, original uh, set of candidate documents into some subsets and using staffing for those subsets, as long as we do not exceed the uh, context uh, length window of the uh, large language model. So still, it's possible to reduce the number of calls to, to the, those large language models and reduce the cost of, of that by it. Um, so there are various ways of how to how to do that, uh, and maybe in a specific case, some of them uh, may work better uh, than the other. But recently, there has been uh, some uh, improvement done in this uh, vector uh, DBQA implementation. There is another chain available which allows to create some uh, interactive uh, agents. Uh, that can keep some memory of our conversation and provide the answers not only based on the current question, but also using some uh, questions and answers from the past, uh, from the from the same uh, conversation. So that's a great building piece for any kind of chatbot uh, that could operate on a knowledge base, like internal knowledge base of the company we work for, because uh, that allows to interact almost uh, as if we are interacting with a real human uh, to extract some uh, useful pieces of information from some longer documents. I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to describe the details of that, but I was just playing with that recently and just thought that could be interesting to showcase that this is also possible with uh, with line chain and uh, vector databases because this is just another chain. Which is pretty simple to be to be implemented with those tools, because the only thing that we need to do is to create another chain and provide the large language model that we decided to use and the vector store uh, that keeps all the knowledge in our in our database. And just after running this single uh, those two uh, those three lines of code actually. We can have a working chatbot solution that will not only uh, extract uh, knowledge from our from our uh, database, but also uh, use uh, our previous interactions. So it will be more natural than before. And this is also uh, quite a short demo, uh, but this is interactive if you uh, want to just uh, try it on your own. This is how it's going to look like. Here I'm just querying the uh, the user to provide a question and then uh, using this chat uh, chat QA uh, object chat QA uh, instance of this of this chain I ask the question and provide the chat history and the chat history is just a list of tuples and each tuple uh, has the query and the answer of the model uh, that was returned uh, to us. Uh, for that specific query. So from the very beginning, it's just empty, but we are just building the chat history uh, with the uh, with the next question uh, coming into the system. Probably we should limit this history to some, uh, let's say, I don't know, last n entries, just because uh, the longer the history, the more complicated it might be to extract the, 
and extract the answer for the next question. But except for that, we are pretty fine to, to, uh, to talk uh, with our knowledge base. And we, not, we do not need to keep all the information uh, in every single question we send. Um, well, I, I just uh, had a look at the, at the database, uh, at the data set that we used, all our documents uh, that we used to create that system. And I just found that there, there is Paul Williams that was uh, composed on the single. So I decided to ask a question, who is a famous ragtime musician? And the answer was Paul Williams. So then, instead of putting his name in my next uh, question, I just referred to, to him uh, in a different way. But still, the system was able to keep that information and provided me the details for that specific person. And then, I also wanted to ask him if he uh, asked the system if this artist played in, a, in a, any specific band. And still, it could it was able to keep that history and to include all the context data that I provided before to uh, provide me with the proper uh, with the proper answer. And that's basically it. Uh, I love Langchain just because that simplifies a lot if you want to experiment with different tools, uh, solve the solve the problems uh, in different ways. Uh, this is really. Um, joyful experience and you can you can do that with just a few lines of code instead of uh, implementing all the integrations on your own uh, so definitely uh, I would like to encourage you to have a closer look at, at Langchain if you use any kind of uh, if you want to uh, design any kind of application that possibly could benefit from using those large language models uh, that's probably the simplest way to go and uh, that would be it regarding the integration of Langchain and Quadrant. Um, hope uh, that uh, you found that interesting. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. But you can also reach me out on LinkedIn or Twitter if you would like to discuss that. I'm not sure if we can. I'm not sure if you can do that. But but uh, I would love to also share this notebook for anybody that would like to reproduce the result to just use that for different purposes. So hopefully we can send the link to it. This was very interesting. And it was actually so interesting that we have a lot of questions in chat. So if you want, we can do a little Q&A after this. So, um, okay. Uh, I'm going to start from the oldest question. Um, so Marco is asking, have you tried other lang or large language models, specifically those that can run locally instead to cloud? If you did, how would you compare them with OpenAI as one, and which one would you consider the best? Um, to be honest, I haven't really tried all the available models. I had uh, I have tried with OpenAI just because that was uh, announced uh, very uh, at the, uh, from the very beginning, and that was pretty interesting to check this out. But that may be a great uh, great comparison, I would say. Uh, just because I, I I have tried some different uh, different uh, third party providers, I have to admit, and some of them uh, were working better in some specific cases, not necessarily in question answering, but uh, but that's quite hard to uh, to compare them in general. Mm, what what I can say is that I was having a lot of troubles with OpenAI, so I'm definitely considering to switch to a different provider as a first choice, just because the the API seems to not to be uh, not to be the most stable one uh, among the competitors, and uh, if you really rely on those models in any real uh, production application. You cannot really stop the stop it from working just because the this API is unreliable. So there are many people experiencing the same. Uh, almost uh, every single week, there are a lot of a lot of issues with the API stability. Uh, but at least for this question answering and for extracting those uh, short, meaningful, uh, meaningful answers, uh, OpenAI was probably the best. At least with the staffing approach, I definitely need to experiment with some different providers as well. But 
Uh, but honestly, I cannot say that one uh, one or the other is is the best for all the use cases, unfortunately. Thanks for that answer. Uh, Mateos is asking, is it possible to find you on the document ranking step in a very specific data set or a language other than English? Yes, that, yes, that, that's of course possible. I'm not sure about, well, of course, those large language models will support uh, multiple languages, but still, if you want to, to use them, then definitely that uh, the, the language has to be supported. But when it comes to those embeddings that are put into, into a vector database, um uh, those I, I i i i did use this uh this uh sentence transformer on purpose just because uh those models are open source and may, may be freely tuned for uh for uh your own uh, data sets for a specific domain that's probably way easier than just uh trying to uh, trying to fine tune those uh, those cloud based uh, models. I know that Cohere allows to fine tune the models, so maybe that's also that's also possible. But definitely, it can be fine tuned for a different uh, different language, different domain, or just a specific area that you are focused on. Uh, this is just like a good general usage model. The sentence transformer that I that I chose. Um, but you can freely uh, fine tune it and just use your own model uh, without uh, without worrying much about that. Because at the end, those are just uh, PyTorch models under the hood, uh, nothing else. Thanks. Um, are these questions is asking Ali from the internet or do you write them yourself? Did you ask these questions to the original chat GPT? I think it's uh, referring to the, yeah, to the questions. Uh... Yeah, yeah. The, maybe I would just come back to that because um, that's basically uh, a natural uh, questions data set that you can uh, find on ai.google.com. I just extracted some of them. This is part of the training set, I believe. Mm, but but those are not written by me. They are just publicly available. Uh, so I just decided to use a subset of them. Uh, I also like this uh, this data set just because it's quite easy to to understand the question. They are just general knowledge questions, not not a specific domain that so everybody can uh, anybody can uh, actually follow them and find the answers on your own. But this is this is publicly available, and here I just uh, linked the subset that I used. But there are uh, thousands of of questions and answers available. Thank you for this answer. Also, the next question comes also from Marco. When using MapReduce approach, would using LangChain's memory parameter help? Uh, yeah, probably. I, I would need to figure it out. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot really pretend to be a LangChain expert just because this is uh, just being developed so fast that I cannot really catch up with all the all the recent news. I tried to do that, but but unfortunately, this is impossible. There are various people working on that already. Uh, also, Harrison, who is in charge of uh, of uh, managing the library, the author of that uh has really hard times because there are so many people really interested in in making some updates mm, unfortunately i do not know that but uh feel just free to to send me in uh, a message i will try to to uh memorize that but we can try to to experiment a bit um but yeah i believe the the memory might be uh might be helpful here not really not really sure that just need to check this out also, things are developing so fast that even if you take a nap, you've missed like so many stuff. So yeah, yeah that's that's yeah. A, re a real issue with that because this is so fast. Uh, really, the, a, a new version is being uh, released, let's say almost every single day, uh, and with multiple updates. Um, Viro is asking, what are some cases where Quadrant shouldn't be used? Um, well, I would say that if you do not know how to encode your data and you, or you still use some sparse vectors or, 
uh, representations, then it shouldn't be used. I also would not recommend using any kind of vector database if you have like uh, just a few dozens of points because uh, you should be fine with uh, simple uh, k-nearest neighbors in such case. Uh, using vector database pays off if you have a few thousand at least or uh, or uh, even millions of, of documents. And uh, well, I would say that's basically it. Well, if you want to perform semantic search there, I would say there is no other way than just using uh, nearest neighbors or some sort of approximation of, uh, of nearest neighbors. Uh, but if you cannot really encode your data into, into vector representations because uh, you lack a, a model that can do it uh, properly, then you probably would uh, really uh, prefer to use some different tools. Uh, we have also published an article about hybrid search recently. There are also some cases like uh, search as you type, let's say, uh, because, that, uh, well, if you, let's say, implement a search bar for, for some kind of documentation and you would like to find the exact match uh, while you are typing, then probably some other tools will be just sim uh, simply faster and also uh, provide some more relevant content just because um, those vector representations won't be uh, won't be uh, correct correctly uh, correctly created for just a part of the words that you that you provide. Uh, but well, if you feel you need to do per semantic search, then I would say Quadrant is, is the best choice. Um, but we also have some benchmarks to support that uh, support uh, that statement. Uh, if you just go to our website, uh, we have this comparison with some different uh, different uh, vector search engines, and Quadrant is just the fastest solution uh, available. Thanks for this really comprehensive answer. We have two more questions, one quite long and white, a little bit shorter. So I'm going to start with a long one. So Vladimir is asking... So as I understood, Langchain in general does pretty similar things like, let's say, haystack, compositions of the different models with using ANN indexes, plus OpenAI API calling. But it is possible to set up some complex pipelines, something similar to DAG maybe, when one chain is processed by one piece of the whole pipe and the other chains are used in the, another, in the other flow. For example, hybrid search through bi-encoder bi retriever and or BM25 retriever and after aggregation co-open AI and question mark. Yeah, yeah, of course, that's in a nutshell uh, what Langchain simplifies. It's somehow similar, of course, to those uh, to those previous uh, libraries like Highstack. Uh, probably uh, Langchain is just more focused on, on those large language models. Uh, high stack and all the other libraries were just implemented when nobody was uh, was talking about large language models. Uh, so that's why they are just uh, and they were just uh, it was just easier to implement something new than than integrating that to the an existing stack. Uh, but yeah, the answer is yes. You can you can design some longer chains. That's uh, where the name of the library comes from. You can create some longer chains. I'm not sure if there is a BM25 implementation already in place, but this is fairly simple to just to just build a, a piece that would be doing that or just uh, uh, will be connecting a specific library that will be uh, doing this BM25 search. So I would say, yeah, the answer is yes. I'm not sure if all the all those steps are already implemented. But if so, then that should be fairly easy to just build this whole pipeline with several branches of, of processing that are eventually combined into a single answer produced by LLM. That's right. Thank you. And the last question from Chad, uh, I think you briefly touched on it, but um, he asked what approach would you suggest if the documents that you're uh, using are confidential? Uh, well, if your documents are confidential, then definitely uh, you cannot send them to any kind of third-party provider as long as you do not have any kind of contract signed. This is like a legal legal issue more than, than technical. 
but uh, there are some uh, models of uh, models that you can run on premise so if you can use those models and if they work on in your specific case then probably that's the that's the only thing that you can do about that um because this prompt that is being sent to llm has to be built using the uh, the content of the of the documents you own so uh, uh so definitely you cannot uh, cannot do that with those uh cloud providers you need to rely on those existing uh models that can be launched on premise i cannot really find any different way to, of how to overcome that so i would say this was this was really interesting we got a lot of questions and answers pun intended um <laughs> And um, yeah, I think in this era of um, proprietary chatbots and AI and language models with um, Google APIs and open AI and GPT and so on, it's really nice to just be able to build something yourself just using open source um, stuff, Quadrant, Langchain, just completely free and accessible. So I think this was really useful for the normal people if i can say so um also really interesting informative and we always ask this question at the end of our talks if you have some kind of personal um subject or a recent paper you read that you really liked it doesn't have to be narrowly uh, related to this uh, topic but maybe something you're interested in some interesting topic you saw in the last uh, few days or something like that um well, if if I knew that before, I would definitely prepare something interesting. Uh, I'm right, uh, right now. I'm uh, currently trying to uh, get through this uh, uh, GPT implementation uh, that Andre Caprati has has published. So this is pretty interesting to create uh, this kind of model uh, on your own. So that's something that I was uh, looking at recently. But I'm not sure if this is something that uh, somebody has not heard about. That was pretty hot. That was the most trending uh, repository on GitHub like a week or two ago. Uh, but that's that's basically something that I would really encourage you to have a look at. And that that is somehow related and probably, probably also a, a great answer for that, uh, for those who wanted to uh, also have it running for uh, for confidential data. You can train that on your own. You can build that system on your specific uh, specific data. Uh, so this is also a great, uh, great replacement for those uh, paid closed services. I think, thank you. That was also a great answer. Um, we're getting some semi-human, semi-chatbot uh, thank yous in the, in the chat also. Um, this was really interesting and um would it be possible if we share the slides and maybe the notebook in our discord if that's okay definitely uh those are actually slides generated from uh, jupyter notebook so this is just a single piece uh definitely i will share a link to it and uh, if anybody wants to just get step by step uh that will be possible Thank you. So we're going to share this on YouTube. I hope many more people see it. And um, yeah, thank you so much for uh, taking the time. Great. Thank you, Martin. Thank everybody thank for you. joining us today. And hopefully um, see you soon, maybe around a different integration of us. Yeah. Everybody leave a star and um, have a nice day. Have a nice day.